I'm coming to you for part two, episode two of this series on the three minds. So if you were with me last week, Deepak and I were chatting about what these three minds are, the nature of these three minds, and how they are applicable to what is happening in society today, but also to our own lives. And after that conversation, I received a lot of questions during this last week about these three minds and clarifying exactly what they are. So this episode today is going to go a little bit more depth into these three minds. And the format we're going to use today is first we'll chat a little bit about these three minds. I'll describe them in a little bit more detail. And then we'll do a Q&A. So whatever questions you might have, we can go through those and clarify what these three minds are and how they are applicable. I can see some comments here in the chat box. Thanks for your comments. And let's start off by addressing, again, why we are talking about these three minds. What I noticed growing up and what I've noticed as an adult is that there is so much information out there. There's so much information, not only in spirituality, but in science, in philosophy, in art, in music, whatever field that you're interested in, there is a entire mountain of knowledge in that field, right? And when we're talking about self-knowledge, when we're talking about self-awareness, then what we're talking about is recognizing not only the deeper aspect of ourself, recognizing not only what we are, but recognizing that in relationship with the world and what is happening in the world, right? This isn't about you and I becoming a hermit and running off to the mountains. This is having a deeper experience of life right here, right now, wherever you are in the midst of the roles that you are playing. And unfortunately, when we have all these different fields of knowledge, there's religion here, there's spirituality here, there's physics here. When we have all of these and nobody has integrated this knowledge, they all look like different kinds of knowledge, different perspectives. But what is it that integrates these perspectives and why does it look so different? Why does this look like one thing and, and physics looks like something else and consciousness looks like something else? It's very hard to integrate our experience of ourselves and the world because the stories that we've been told have been radically incomplete. So this was a problem I had growing up. And I always thought that, you know, if ever I communicate about something, it will be to reconcile all of these things, to kind of organize all of these fields of knowledge with the experience that we can have of what we are, the deeper aspect of ourselves. So my suggestion to you is that all the world's knowledge, regardless of who is saying it, from what perspective and what their interest is, it can be broadly categorized into these three frames, which I call the three minds, okay? And then ultimately, it's not just about understanding the world's knowledge. That's not our main goal here. It's an important side effect, but the main goal here is understanding ourselves. And understanding ourselves so deeply, so completely, so assuredly, seeing ourselves so clearly that no matter what somebody is saying about some other field, some other aspect of knowledge, right? Let them be any kind of expert. They have all kinds of degrees and all kinds of whatever it may be. But no matter what they're saying, we can see exactly how that aligns with our own deeper experience of ourselves, right? So that contradiction is not there anymore. That doubt, that, that fluctuation, that, you know, but that doesn't make sense, but this doesn't make sense. That kind of disturbance in the mind isn't there anymore. It's not that we understand everything and we get everything. There's always more to learn. However, the essential nature of things, the essential nature of myself and the essential nature of the world and the essential nature of all these fields of knowledge is recognized and it shines through all of these conversations. Okay, 
So this is why the three minds are important. This is why I'm just looking at your comments here. Thank you. This is why we are talking about this topic. And this is also why I'm spending a second episode on this. Even if Deepak and I touched on it last week, I want to give this some more dedicated time. And we'll see how much we get through today, right? Well, depending on how deep we go, how the questions go, we can always spend more time on it next week. So let's take it as it goes and see what happens, okay? We're going to experiment together, the bottom line being to discover ourselves and how it relates to the world without contradictions. So this, this is the three minds. One more note about our approach and how we're gonna be doing this. See, I can say all kinds of stories. I can tell all kinds of stories. But ultimately, the most important thing happening right now is you and your awareness. The most important thing happening right now is not this story that I'm saying, but rather your awareness and what it sees from these stories, how it interprets and assimilates these stories. So because of that, I'm going to use a tool of silence, pauses, as we go, right? Because the content of this, the content of the three minds, is not that much content, right? It's, if you look at it as just a series of thoughts or a series of concepts, there are not that many concepts. However, it is deep. It is subtle. And the more we progress along these three minds, the subtler it gets. And the way to apprehend subtlety, the way to assimilate subtlety into our own experience is to give space. So right now, I'm going to give a little space. And in these spaces, allow the content to sink in and allow your own awareness to come into the foreground, right? So let the content sink in, let it become more than a concept, and then bring your attention from the background to the foreground, your own awareness. Your own awareness is number one. And everything else is seen and recognized only in the context and in the light of your own awareness. Okay, so that was the second program note. So with that, let's get started. You know, you might have seen all kinds of stories about superheroes. I was just talking with one of my friends just a few minutes ago and he was wearing a Marvel shirt, you know, Marvel Comics, right? Superheroes, right? So why do we love superheroes? Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman. Why do we love superheroes? Well, we love superheroes because within each of us, within each person, there is a feeling inside that we are super. There's no doubt about it. Within every person, deep inside, whether we consciously think it or not, there's a feeling somewhere inside that we are super, that there is something super about us, right? And that psychological mentality, that inner recognition is what is showing up in the world as all of these superhero movies and superhero characters. And in fact, if you look at it, how do these superheroes present themselves usually? It's usually an alter ego, right? There's, so for Batman, there's Bruce Wayne. And Bruce Bruce Wayne is, he has one life as a, as a business guy and he's buttoned up and the suit and the meetings and decisions and all this kind of stuff, right? And then when the need is there, when stuff has to get done, what happens? He rips it off and all of a sudden there's a Batman costume, right? Or Superman or Wonder Woman, right? They change, they switch their identities to an alter ego. Ego. They go from one person to an apparently quite a different person. The first person can often be quiet, 
they're not as outspoken, you know, they're not as showy. And then all of a sudden, boom, right? They become the superhero and now they're out there. They're communicating, they're interacting with the world, they're doing things with other people, they're quote unquote saving the day, right? Where does that come from? That comes from that inner psyche, that inner mentality that all of us have. And this, in a way, is a hint or an approach to what we call the three minds. Because what I'm suggesting here is that how we are recognizing ourselves in this moment and the way we present ourselves in this lifetime to our family, to our friends, to the people we get along with, the people we don't get along with, is all based on the mental configuration. Okay? It's based on our mental configuration, just like your device you're using now, your smartphone or your laptop or your desktop, it's configured a particular way, right? It, it handles the voltage in a particular way. You attach the power cord and it takes that voltage and it makes the, the chips, the microchips function, and it results as this display on the screen, right? There's a particular configuration, a hardware configuration for this device that you're using. And that determines how you experience this device, what you experience on the screen, the video, the audio, etc. And in the exact same way, in the exact same way, our minds have a configuration. Okay? Each of these minds have a configuration. And depending on how it's configured, we see ourselves and we see the world in a particular way. So with that let's get into the configuration of the first mind. What is this first mind? First of all, why do I call it the first mind? I call it the first mind because this is the mind that our society essentially teaches us or hand us, hands to us early in life. So when we're born, our orientation is not that of a first mind. In fact, if you watch a newborn, they're often not well oriented to the body, right? They can feel pain and they'll react to that pain. But the moment that pain is gone, the crying is gone too, right? Their association with the body is not that strong. In fact, most of their time is spent sleeping. Now, over the first couple years of life, we start to teach that infant over and over. Hey, you are, let's pick a random name, Sarah. You are Sarah. And I am not Sarah, I am a noob. And then what we start to do is teach this infant to begin to identify themselves in relationship to this body. We say, these are your eyes, and this is your nose, and this is your mouth, and these are your hands. And now what happens is the intelligence that is presenting itself as this baby is now becoming associated and its vision is becoming fixed on this particular thing that we call a body. So what is the first mind? The first mind is the sense of identification and localization in the body. Okay? This is the first mind configuration. The mind assumes a particular configuration of being localized. What do I mean being localized? It means that it's in one particular place. It is here and it is not there, right? It's in one particular place. And where is that one particular place? It's in the body. So how do we recognize this first mind configuration? We recognize it because the feeling is that what I am is a body or that what I am is restricted to a body. And all these things out here, the room, the sky, the stars, the trees, the other people, they are something else, right? Remember, this is not about conceptualizing. This is a fundamental feeling that we have. The fundamental feeling of the first mind is I am here, I am in this body, and outside at the boundary of my skin, where my skin ends, what I am ends. And now that thing over there, that's furniture, or that's a tree, or that's a sky, and that's not really me, that's something else. And that feeling that I'm saying, that I'm suggesting, is the way to diagnose the first mind, all right? So the first mind, somebody wrote me, mine, yes, exactly. So when the sense of 
me, mine is localized to the body, then yes, that is the feeling of the first mind. Now, I actually drew a very crude drawing of the first mind. Let's see if it shows up. Can you see this? So what is the point of this drawing? What am I showing here? Notice a couple things. One is that the smile is kind of crooked. Sometimes smiling, sometimes not smiling, right? The first mind, what it experiences is a life of ups and downs. Yay, this is good. Oh, this is terrible. Yay, this is good. Oh, this is terrible. Ups and downs, ups and downs. Why? Because the vision is limited to a particular perspective. So always experiencing these ups and downs and often downs because it's not experiencing the rest of what it is. Okay, the other thing to notice here is this, this boundary, right? Notice this circle, this boundary that I've noted around it. That is the feeling, the feeling that what I am is inside this box, inside this circle. This is where the phrase out of the box thinking comes from. Why do we want out of the box thinking? Because the feeling to begin with is that we are localized within a box. So our way of talking about creativity, our way of talking about innovation is to say out of the box thinking. But when we say that, we don't recognize that the box we are referring to is the boundary of the first mind. And stepping out of that first mind boundary results in an experience of creativity and openness. And so this first mind's definition of boundary shows up so much in our society. For example, you'll hear people say, I need more space. I need more space, right? What does that mean? Going on vacation, going on vacation because I want to get space. We're making it into physical space. I want to get out of the home or out of the workplace. I need to go on a vacation to a broad, wide space. Maybe it's the beach, right? Maybe it's the mountains, somewhere a broad, wide space. Why is that? Because the mind is in a closed space. The boundary of the mind is very tight. And the, the way that is expressed is I need space, right? People might say, you know, give me some space. Give me some space. Give me some time. I, I just need some time. I need some space. Just let me figure this out. Meaning what? Meaning that that sense of constriction and boundary is strong. I'll give you another example. In the ER, sometimes we have to get MRIs for emergent conditions, right? So if, for very particular kind of conditions, we might have to do an emergent MRI to diagnose something. Now, when we do that, the patient has to be rolled on the stretcher, they go to the MRI machine and get in the MRI machine. And what's unique to the MRI machine compared to others, you might know if you've had an MRI, most MRIs are closed, right? They have, you have to close the top for it to function. And for some people, when that top is closed, when the MRI is completely closed, they experience claustrophobia. And what is claustrophobia? It's that feeling of fear or feeling of suffocation that happens when the machine is completely closed. So they're lying there in the chamber and the tube is closed and there's a feeling of suffocation, right? What is happening here is that first mind identity, the feeling of constriction, when it's reflected in the world, for example, that MRI machine is now closed and it's resonating with that first mind sensation, then it strengthens it even more. And it feels literally like the person is being suffocated, like the walls are closing in. That is the first mind boundary squeezing down on the mind and giving this feeling of not being able to breathe. How does a boa constrictor work? How does a snake kill its prey? a boa constrictor, it constricts. And every time a person tries to breathe in, it tightens a little bit more. And every time breathe in, it tries. So what is happening? Instead of that expansion, it's contracting, it's contracting, it's contracting. It's the exact same feeling in claustrophobia. And the origin of that experience, the psychological experience, is this first mind configuration. And so in the ER, what do we have to do for that? We often have to give sedatives. Because that first mind awareness, the awareness of that configuration has to be released. Otherwise, it's going to continually give this feeling of suffocation. And so we might give certain medications to allay that feeling 
temporarily to allay that awareness of that configuration so that they can experience, they can have the MRI. All right, so what is the first mind? It's the feeling of a constricted boundary. It's the feeling of being localized in the body. And it's the feeling that everything else is disconnected or separate or different from myself. Okay, so a couple more things about this first mind. We're going to get a little bit into metaphysics here. And I, I say this because remember the beginning Beginning, I said that when we start to get to know ourselves better, right, what ha happens is there can be different stories, right? I know myself in a one way, but I hear all these stories about other people and other fields of knowledge, and it doesn't reconcile. It doesn't make sense with what I feel. So because of that, now we have come to a time in spirituality, in this field of self-discovery, where metaphysics and the nature of the world has to be integrated with our own experience of ourselves. And we're going to explore this just a little bit here. So this first mind, this localized sense of identity, this boundary that we experience as the first mind, as me, when this boundary manifests, when we experience this boundary, then we superimpose that on the world. And we start to see a world of bounded things. Let's take a pause here. So when this boundary, when this feeling of localization of the first mind appears, it superimposes a world of also bounded and localized things. Okay, what does that mean? That means that when the first mind looks out at the world, it sees discrete things with discrete boundaries. Like the screen you're looking at now might look like a rectangle, right? If you look up at a cloud, the cloud has a very distinct boundary. If you look at the ceiling in your room, it will have lines that make it a very distinct ceiling. The ceiling is different from the wall. There's a very clear boundary there. These boundaries, what I'm suggesting to you, are not independent characteristics of the world. It is not that these boundaries are originally the nature of this world and what is here, but rather because of the mental configuration of the first mind, it is superimposing its own boundaries on the world. The fundamental position I'm taking and I'm suggesting to you is that this original world, the original state of the world, the original nature of this world is consciousness itself, period. The original nature of this world is consciousness itself. Now, by original, do I mean years ago? Do I mean billions of years ago? Do I mean before the Big Bang, the world was just consciousness? No, I mean right now, the world is consciousness alone. And when that consciousness takes a configuration of a first mind, it interprets an entire sea of objects. It's a sea of objects, just like you would see objects floating in the sea. You see ships floating in the sea, right? In the same way, these objects are floating, as it were, in consciousness. Literally, the earth is floating, isn't it? It's easy to forget that the ground beneath us that feels so stable is spinning in multiple axes. It's spinning on its own axis. It's spiraling around the sun. The sun is, is flying around the Milky Way. These objects, these planets are floating. And similarly, these objects that we're interpreting, whether it's the globe, whether it's the Milky Way, whether it's the screen you're looking at, or indeed, whether it's your own body and my own body. These objects are interpretations of this first mind configuration. They're superimpositions of this first mind configuration. One example of this, I gave this example last week too in talking with Deepak. 
is imagine that you're wearing pink tinted sunglasses. Okay? Now, of course, what's the world going to look like? Obviously, it's going to be pink. Everything is going to be pink, and everything is going to be a shade of pink. In fact, it would be impossible to see anything but a shade of pink, right? Even the darkest dark color and the brightest bright color would have some shade of pink in it because the very lens that we are looking through and seeing the world through is pink. And no matter what else I am aware of, no matter what else I might know about the world, I, I have all kinds of knowledge. I may be an expert. I might do all kinds of studies. No matter what I do, if I don't recognize this configuration of this lens through which I'm looking to, I will never know what the world is actually like. I will never know the colors of the world because I don't recognize that the colors of the world I'm seeing are superimposed by this lens of my pink tinted sunglasses. And in the exact same way, this first mind configuration, this sense of localization, this sense of a boundary, this feeling of being within a body, that boundaryness, if I may make up a word, that boundaryness is superimposed on whatever it is that is here and it self modifies as what we call the objects of this world. And this is why when we try to investigate the nature of an object, it disappears, right? If you try to, if you see a huge boulder and we say, well, look, here's a boulder here. I know what this is. It's, it's a huge rock. It's made up of minerals. But as we look into that deeper and deeper and we find out that well, it's actually made of molecules. Well, those are made of atoms. Those are made of subatomic particles. Well, those are actually made of fields. And now you start asking what a field is made of and what has happened to that huge, solid, massive boulder. It literally has vanished. As soon as we start to examine what it is made of, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller up to a point. Then it gets bigger and bigger. It, it's made of fields that extend throughout space. So when we say a boulder, when we say a screen, when we say a body, what is it that we're actually talking about? What is the fundamental substance, if I may use that word, that is then appearing as these objects? That is what I'm calling consciousness. And that is not something that was in the past or that's in the future. It is what is here right now. And depending on the mental configuration, how it is recognized is different. Pause here for a second. Okay, so we just talked about the metaphysical aspect, which is that this boundedness of the first mind is superimposed and projected onto this world. So the world we see is not the world as it is. It is an interpretation of the mental configuration, not metaphorically, literally. It is literally an interpretation. This is not a popular story, the story that I'm telling you. It's not a popular st story. It's not one that we're told in school. It's not one that's taught in graduate school. It's not one that's taught in medical school, right? It may be taught in some graduate programs, in some philosophy programs. They might have their own slant, their own variation of this. Generally speaking, it is not in our educational system, the world educational system, because our culture is so drenched in this idea that the world as we see it is, we take it at face value. Okay. Now the object of science, of course, is to say, hey, here's where we're starting. 
And now let me interpret this. Let me look into this and see. And we know that our perceptions are not showing us what actually is, but they're showing us interpretations. For example, we see the sun set, but we know the sun does not set. Rather, the earth moves, right? And we know that there are optical illusions. So we have figured out that what we see is not always what we get. It's not always what is. However, what we have not recognized yet generally is the extent to which that is true. It is not only that we are seeing things in a different light or that we're misinterpreting things lightly. It is that the very appearance of form, the very appearance of discrete things itself is a superimposition of the mind. And the original nature of what is here is consciousness itself appearing as these configurations and these interpretations of the world. And a simple way to say this, as the mind is, so the world appears, right? As the mind is, so the world appears. Not metaphorically, not just in terms of my beliefs of the world, not just in terms of my interpretations of the world, but the literal perceptions of the world, the visualizations of the world, the auditory recognition of the world is a superimposition of the mind itself. Now, I was going to go through all of these three minds and then ask for questions. But if you have any questions here, I think it might be a good time to pause. So let me see. Understood, great. Contentness, great. Diane Johnson says, please continue your talks. I totally agree. Great. Second mind. Great. All right. So let's move on to the second mind. If the first mind is the sense of boundedness, then the second mind is what all the wisdom traditions of the world are talking about. All right. So the first mind seeks freedom and the second mind rests in freedom. That boundary that's there in the first mind, that sense of boundedness, the sense of identity localized within that is now no longer restricted to that experience and no longer restricted to the experience of form. Okay, here's my picture for it. Let's see. So this was the first mind, right? The main thing being the fixed boundary. The second mind would be something like this. It's not showing up well. Actually, it's a, it's a good image because what you can see is that there's not much of a boundary there right? There's a little bit, what I did was I lightened up the boundary. I made it kind of dot, 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 so that you can see through the boundary. But the vision itself, the experience of, experience of identity itself is not restricted to this boundary. So what's another way to say this? The experience goes from saying that the mind is in the body or that I am in the body but now the eye switches and the eye shifts beyond the body. And that experience is that the body is in me. Yeah, so first I am in the body in the first mind. And next, second mind is the body is in me. Now, is this what people refer to as out of body experiences and such? It's related to that, but remember here, the idea is not that we are out of the body, right? If we're out of the body, it still has that first mind connotation because we're still identifying the body as primary and the line, the boundary as primary. And now what we're saying is we're not inside this boundary, we're outside this boundary, right? So what we're saying instead is that 
we are beyond the boundary of the body, such that the sense of inside and outside is now no longer predominant. In the first mind, I'm definitely inside, right? My thoughts, it's in the head, my feelings, it's in the body, it's in the chest, and the other pe person's feelings are over there. In the second mind, it's the thoughts are no longer localized to a particular person. The feelings are not, not strictly localized to a particular person. And perception itself is not localized to just that particular body. So the sense of inside and outside goes away in the second mind, right? What's one way to think about this? Let's say, if you had a house, let's say it's a very simple house. It's one room and it's got four walls, right? And what we say is that we are inside the house, open the door, we go outside, and now we say we're outside the house, inside and outside. What defines the inside and outside of this house? Well, it's obviously the walls, right? If we now take those walls and we move them in, it's a much smaller house, then inside gets shrunk. The area of inside gets shrunk. If we move those walls, let's say a mile wide, we have a mile, um, it's one square mile, this house, right? Walls all around at one mile distance. Now that entire mile, square mile distance is inside. So it's not the size, but it's the boundary that defines inside and outside. Now let's pretend this is a magic house and the roof can stay on even without any walls. Let's just pretend, All right? So the roof is still there, all the walls disappear. Now are you inside the house or outside the house? Doesn't make any sense, right? There is no longer inside and outside. It is the boundary that defines the sense of inside and the sense of outside. In the second mind, this boundary of being stuck within dissolves. Not completely, but to an extent that that sense of inside-outside constriction within the body, out of the body, this diminishes. The experience of this is quite literally seen in the picture. Remember the first picture? A very hard, a very discrete boundary right? In the second picture, the boundary was very light and it was porous. There was much more space than actual boundary. Well, what is the experience of that? Openness, creativity, right? Remember we were talking about outside the box. Well, the identity is now outside the box as well as what was previously inside the box. Here, the sense of I that was here, localized here, Oh, it's terrible. Here we go. The sense of I that was localized here is now also here. It's no longer restricted to that. So the second mind configuration is when the I goes beyond that sense of the individual I and establishes itself as something which experiences all form and all function. All right. So it's clear the boundedness of the first mind and the unboundedness near unboundedness of the second mind. There still has to be some sense of boundary. For the body to function, there still has to be some sense of boundary. For a person to engage in conversation, to recognize the objects of the world, to interface with the world, there has to be some sense of boundary. Otherwise, where's the distinction between what we call a body and some other object, right? So it is not complete unboundedness, but it is this state of functioning through a greater sense of identity that is not constricted. I'm looking at some of these comments. Zen contentness, bigger, more open, yes, one with the all, oneness with all, yes. This idea of oneness, this idea of waking up, all of these pertain to this second mind configuration. Now, when we talk about the metaphysics of this, what are the metaphysics of the second mind? In the second mind configuration, what the second mind sees is primarily itself. 
okay? So let's compare it with the first mind, awareness, unity for all, one with the all. Let's compare this with the mind, what to identify with then. Let me just click on this. I'm just gonna keep this comment here. Thank you, Bryce, what to identify with. I wanna click it now because I don't wanna forget it. It's an excellent question. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of good questions now. Let's see. Let me get back to this point, the metaphysics of the second mind, and then we will address this. Remember, the first mind metaphysics, which is what? When the first mind looks at the world, it sees objects. Why? Because it projects and superimposes its own boundedness on the world, and it sees only bound things, particular things, distinct things, things with a boundary, right? First mind sees objects. The second mind, however, sees that which is appearing as objects. And what is it that is appearing? It is this second mind itself. It is this deeper consciousness. So when I say the second mind sees itself, it is a self-awareness. It is a recognition of what I am beyond the limitations of time and space, right? Objects are in time and space. Every object, including this body, starts at a particular time and it will end at a particular time. Even mountains, right, that have been there for thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years or longer, they had a beginning. They formed in some way. And at some point, day two will be gone, right? So all objects are limited in time and all objects are limited in space. There's no object that goes on forever. Here's another good question. I'm gonna to try to address these, okay? So all there's no object that goes on forever. It has a particular limitation. So the metaphysics of the second mind is that awareness, that underlying awareness recognizes itself, which is then modifying as this world of objects. All right, the first mind sees objects primarily that are different from itself. The second mind recognizes itself as this awareness, as consciousness, modifying as objects. So it is the objects that we see, like for example, this screen that we're seeing, the object itself is secondary, right? The common story of perception is told from the first mind level, where the light reflects from the object, comes back, etc. But from the second mind configuration, the object itself is secondary to the initial awareness, the initial light of awareness that is already present and then modifies as both the object and the subject that's perceiving. Okay, so I get this, yay, Tammy said, great. So what is my identity? So I see a lot of good questions now. Let's pause here for just a few moments. We still have some time left and then I will address some of these questions. All right, so the quick, the first question here rather is from Bryce, what to identify with then? Right, so the identification in the first mind is with the body. In the second mind, the identification is with the consciousness that is appearing as the body. All right, the identification is with the consciousness that is appearing as the body. Now. There's a difference between those, these two in that in the first mind, it is consciousness itself which has identified as a particular personality and as a particular body and then experiences only that aspect of itself. Remember our fundamental premise, consciousness is fundamental in appearing as these forms. So even in the first mind, that is the case. It is consciousness that is self-modifying as the lens of a first mind, right? So the identity Identification is with the first mind, which experiences itself as a particular body, as a localized mind, as my thoughts, my feelings, and so on and so forth. So when this consciousness identifies 
with this, the view is only from the first mind, right? It is not that what you are fundamentally, what the first mind is fundamentally, is just a body. No, even now, regardless of the mental configuration, consciousness is still what is fundamental in the perspective I'm sharing, and it's still what is appearing as this body and personality and first mind and second mind and all this kind of stuff. But the identification in the first mind is restricted to that vision, right? That tunnel vision through that particular looking glass. Now, in the second mind, the identification is not with the particular object, but rather with that consciousness itself, which is then modifying as that object. So the vision has now changed, where now the mind is recognizing much more of what it is. It's recognizing its more essential nature and so naturally, the identification is with that. It is not with a form, but it is with that consciousness that is appearing as a form. So the presence, the experience of form is still there. But the difference is, is the formlessness, the consciousness itself is recognized. The age old example is that of water, the ocean and the wave, right? It is that ocean itself, which appears as the wave. The wave may think, the wave in this case is the first mind. The wave may think, look at me, I'm huge, I'm a huge wave. Another wave may think, oh, I'm just a small wave, right? But, but essentially, it, they only think that because they're not recognizing that they are simply this expression of the ocean. They are in themselves a beautiful expression of the ocean, beautifully big or beautifully small, or beautifully powerful, or beautifully subtle, right? Each wave is its own expression, and the beauty that it has is derived from the ocean itself. The grandeur of the wave is derived from the grandeur of the ocean. But if that's not recognized, then each wave has its own complex. Look how big I am, look how small I am, so on and so forth. But now imagine that the wave has now gained the vision of the ocean, meaning what? Meaning that it has lost its sense of boundary. It is no longer seeing itself primarily as a wave. It's seeing primarily its essential nature appearing as this wave. That is the second mind. The second mind recognizes itself, its own innate nature as consciousness, and has not forgotten the wave, still recognizes the body, still recognizes those individual tendencies, still recognizes individual objects, still recognizes the sky and the moon, still recognizes all the stories we tell at the first mind level. However, it is no longer restricted to them. It no longer derives its experience of the world from them. It no longer derives its sense of what it is or what is possible from first mind stories because it recognizes, as soon as it recognizes another wave or something else, it sees the essence of that as itself. All right, so the succinct answer, Bryce, to your question, what to identify with, it is consciousness being aware of itself. It is self-awareness, identification as consciousness. I won't say it's identification with consciousness. We sometimes say that, but there is no other consciousness to be identified with, right? There's no, it's not that what I am is a body and now I have to identify with consciousness. No, what I am is consciousness itself. And it is simply being identified as one's own nature, not being dependent on a form to be identified with, and then recognizing the forms that arise from that. All right, let me try to go back. I saw a lot of good questions fly by. Okay, I can't find them all, but there was one about psychedelics and psychedelic experience and if that and how that relates to all this. And what is a psychedelic from a first mind perspective, right? So the other thing that this shows us is that almost anything we talk about, any conversation we have with anybody, there is always a perspective that it's coming from. Now, we all know this intuitively. When we hear it, it makes sense. Well, of course, everybody has their own perspective. I'm not just talking about everybody having their own perspective because each person has their perspective, right? Their culture, etc. Each first mind has its own perspective. 
But what I'm saying, the per perspective itself, the nature of perspective itself changes. So when we talk about psychedelics, most of this conversation, we're going to be talking from a first mind perspective. What happens with psychedelics? Well, a psychedelic 